Writing laws is easy, but governing is difficult. Good evening and welcome. This is Face the Nation. Our topic of discussion today is threatening people's right to know the truth with an emphasis on the Broadcasting Regulatory Commission Bill. Joining us tonight on the show are Professor Rohan Samarjeva, Chairperson of Learn Asia, Attorney at Law Bhavani Fonseca, Senior Researcher, Centre for Policy Alternatives, Dr. Rohan Tatakorala, former Chairman of the EDB and Tourism, Manjul Gajanayaka, Executive Director, Institute for Democratic Reforms, and electoral studies. On to my immediate left to pose questions today on the show is Niresh, our senior journalist, joining us this evening on the show. You can also join in with the conversation. You can log on to our Facebook page, like it, subscribe it, and then you can join in the conversation. You could also send in your questions to the number 076 656 5353, the number once again, 076 656 5353. So let's get the ball rolling tonight with Professor Rohan Samarjeeva, Chairperson of Learn Asia, on the topic threatening people's right to know the truth. Um, I'm a little surprised by the title with, because there seems to be a conclusion therein. I prefer to deal with these things in terms of questions rather than conclusions. Uh, I think there is an attempt, I think the reference is to a bill that has been brought, which I do not like, uh, to regulate electronic media. Uh, I think uh, this, this particular discussion draft um, contradicts uh, what the critical um, judgment that was given back in 1997, when a similar, uh, well in that case it was an actual bill, uh, was gazetted and it went for constitutional review and uh, Chief Justice GPS De Silva uh, and Justices Ramanathan and Amarasingha gave a, gave a decision uh, which was quite, uh, <laughs> quite broad, so to speak. They didn't say that particular sections were offensive and that if they were removed uh, it would be consistent with the constitution. They basically said the whole thing is inconsistent with the constitution. So if you want to get it through, get two-thirds uh, majority and put it to a referendum. So it's, I have seen uh, one of those decisions in a while. I've been reading some of these things. You know. So um, I got involved in this process in 1998 because when that thing crashed and burned and the minister was changed, uh, they decided to create a select committee in parliament to deal with this subject because there was still the understanding that uh, the uh, issuance of licenses was uh, to broadcasters was quite, um, let's say, um, informal, uh, not organized, uh, heterogeneous, uh, and something needed to be done. So I was asked uh, to serve as the compiler of the submissions that were brought before the uh, select committee. That didn't really go anywhere in the two years. And then in 2003, there was another attempt to, uh, in the context of uh, the East Sri Lanka program, to develop a draft. That also crashed. Uh, and now we are dealing with this. Uh, but just before this happened, in 2018, I was asked to chair a committee uh, with a number of uh, Sri Lankan experts uh, to develop a, um, well, essentially a solution to the problem. And uh, we developed a report. Um, and uh, what uh, could be the basis of an uh, of a, of a act, uh, of course not in the legal draftsman's format. Uh, and uh, we gave it to the minister, but then, you know, 2018, uh, things happened. Uh, minister portfolios changed, uh, Easter bombing happened, various things happened and uh, that went nowhere. So when I look at this bill, I look at it in, in contrast to the work that we did which I believe uh, drew on the best practices, uh, drew on a model not of pure self-regulation, but of a form of co-regulation, and was introducing the concept of modern licensing, which is found in uh, other utility sectors that I work in. Uh, in modern licenses, the licenses ob imposes obligations on both parties. 
So uh, it Im imposes obligations on the licensor as well as the licensee and provides significant safeguards to the licensee uh, in terms of the procedures that have to be followed to uh, declare that there's a violation of a term of license or anything like that. Uh, because you see, the, the other part of it is, while we can say that uh, licensing has been quite irregular, we actually have had uh, three uh, overnight uh, license uh, cancellations in this country. Uh, Raja FM, uh, all 2006, 2007, Raja FM, the entire uh, radio broadcasting network of Hiru, uh, overnight, uh, and um, the uh, CBN SAT and LBN licenses, the satellite retransmission licenses, also being cancelled. And if you look at, uh, I will conclude with this, if you look at how two of those licenses were restored, uh, which uh, were quite uh, questionable means, mm. where a person <laughs> processed over to the government party, uh, a massive uh, 67 million Sri Lanka rupees donation is given to the Chief Justice's favorite charity and things of that nature. You can imagine that the licenses that didn't get cancelled were somewhat tainted with various deals and understandings. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rohan Samanjeeva, Chairperson of Learn Asia. Uh, I now move my attention towards Attorney at Law Bhavani Fonseca, Senior Researcher, Center for Policy Alternatives. Thank you, Shamir. And I mean, the topic itself, I think, raises a lot of questions at this time, considering a lot of other issues that's happening. But I think fundamentally, we need to understand what does freedom of expression mean in Sri Lanka at this moment, but also looking at what's happened in the past. So when we talk about proposed laws, one of the things I would like to be very clear is what is the intention of the government of the day in terms of bringing something like the present document. I won't even say it's a bill because it hasn't been gazetted and as far as we know the government keeps saying this is a white paper or a concept note or whatever. Um, and there are lots of I think gaps in this that we can go into. But in terms of the whole idea of it, and looking at just even this year, what the government has tried to do is they, a couple of months ago, and in this program, we had this discussion about the proposed anti-terror law. Now that again was an attempt to restrict people's rights and freedom of media, freedom of expression was going to be one aspect. Now this has come about, and the whole question is what is the intention? And from all of this, one re realizes that there are insidious attempts by the government to control one's thought, one's expression, one's speech. And as a lawyer, I'll also say fundamental <coughs> rights guarantee freedom of expression. It's a, it's a right. It's not an absolute right, but it's a right. And what we've seen in, in through the years, through the Supreme Court, is that there are a very vigorous attempt to protect fundamental rights and freedom of expression. Now, it's also very important that in 1997, as Rohan mentioned, there, there was a bill that was challenged, mm. and the Supreme Court, in a, I mean, a excellent determination, goes into some of these aspects. And I think it's very important when we talk about something of a proposal to understand what was done before. Have lessons not been learned? Um, the Supreme Court is very clear. You can have licenses, but it shouldn't impede people's right to get information, to be able to express. And there's been several other judgments after that by the Supreme Court. We can go into it in terms of protecting this very, very fragile but very important right. So this particular document the question would be to the government is why now? What is it that they're trying to do? Do they foresee a prospect where people are going to be critical? Media institutions are going to be critical. And is this going to be the latest tool, latest tool in a whole series of attempts by the government to really say how people should think, how people should speak? 
So it's as I said very very worrying as to that this is even a document that people are considering um, especially in the terms of what it implies to people's rights mm. but I think this g very fundamental issue of is the government now bringing in various ways of controlling all forms of behavior, thought, speech. So I will say at the very outset, this is just something that we need to really question, critique and challenge as much as possible. Uh, Bhavani, very quickly, uh, uh, many opposition parties claim that the next few months are going to be tough for Sri Lanka. It's going to be a tough period, just as we witnessed last year during the Aragalaya. <coughs> is this effort being taken to suppress the media because of such an impending situation that may arise in the country in the future? It looks like it, Shamir. I mean, that's why I said we need to think about what has the government done in the last few months. So just this year, we had this anti-terror law that was the proposal brought about. And the reason they went back to the drawing boards is because we challenged, we critiqued in this program and outside, we really raised the question, what is the intention? Now, even last year, if one remembers, they tried to bring in a rehabilitation authority. It's now law, but in this program, but outside, we challenged it yeah. and said, why do you need such a broad-based law? Now these are all i think part of a series it's not an accident these are not happening in a vacuum so that's why i said what is the intention mm. and the intention seems to be really to curtail people's ability to dissent and that dissent will be met with real serious consequences and that's hopefully something we can unpack today thank you very much um, attorney at lobavani fonseca senior researcher Center for Policy Alternatives. I now move my attention towards Dr. Rohan Tatakorala, former chairman of EDB and Tourism. <coughs> what are your thoughts, uh, Rohan? Thank you very much, Shamir. Just to give a context, um, my background is from British multinationals for about 20 years, and then I also worked for the UN for about five years. So, you know, when something is brought about in terms of policy, and in terms of practice into an industry, uh, we always look at the pros and the cons, and we look at the depth of it. Um, and from that light, I see the good and the bad coming out. Um, if I mention the good, is that strictly if you look at the white paper that has been brought about, in, um, in objectives E, it says determine the number of licenses that could be obtained by a person or a broadcasting entity for the purpose of providing broadcasting services. So if I look at that one, I think it, there is some logic to that objective. Why? Because we have 18 TV stations, we have Radio 44 stations, and we have uh, newspapers about 15. And for a small market which is about um, 21 million people, to have so much of um, media uh, is, is actually over uh, share of voice. Uh, in 2022, we have spent about 161 billion Sri Lankan rupees uh, in terms of advertising spend. So, um, you know, how you're going to consolidate this, uh, how it's going to be easy for businesses in terms of advertising, uh, creating that kind of awareness level and the top of the mind. Uh, there's some logic that could happen and it might simplify business. So I'm talking about the good of what I see from this white paper. What I see the negative is that just like what was discussed, it's a timing. Is this what the country actually requires? Um, our economy, which was 83 billion, has shrunk to about 70 billion. We have gone from 7.8% 7, 7 drop to about 3% GDP drop this time. Our total brand value has dropped from about 84 billion to about 70 billion dollars. So, what global thinking comes out when it, in terms of building your brand value is that the people must share their voice. The truth needs to be told so that people around the world believe and that's exactly what is going to help you to rebuild the credibility of the nation and once you rebuild what happens is it helps in your exports, it helps you to attract top quality tourists and foreign direct investments. So this particular bill if 
it's going to curtail that truth to be told, then the question is, it's against the spirit of the macro challenge that the country needs to do. So that's my view um, of this bill. Uh, Rhonda, you spoke about the timing of the bill and this is not the right time. Um, I want to take your memory a few weeks back when the IMF regulations came into play, where they very clearly point out that an anti-corruption uh, bill needs to be brought in to ensure that the country is on the right track. Uh, when such an urgent requirement is the need of the hour, why is the government, in your opinion, trying to focus on something of this sort? That's, that's actually the key issue that we need to discuss today, Samir. Because see, if the law is being implemented and you would find who is right and who is wrong, the media reports exactly what was done. But if the law is going to protect people who are corrupt, then question is, if the media brings this out to the surface, is it wrong? For example, if you take the fertilizer scandal that happened, I mean, <coughs> fertilizer was bought from China, $6.9 million, then it was sent back because it didn't uh, meet the certain quality standards. So far, we have not got the money, we have not got the fertilizer. No, now, we paid, we paid the 6.9 million. Yeah, so we, we have not got the fertilizer. It. We didn't get the fertilizer, we didn't get the return money back. Mm. So now the question is, if the media brings this out, is it wrong? It's a truth well told. If the media didn't bring this out, none of us would have not even known that there was this scandal. So if the law was used to find who are the people who were the perpetrators, and if it was implemented, then there is nothing called a bill that is required <coughs> because it's the truth being told. So I think, like you very rightly said, Shamir, I mean, for the first time in IMF uh, stipulations, um, under Section 5, it says uh, the anti-corruption bill needs to be brought in, you know. And, and why have they done that? Because they believe that the truth is not being held. And, and if you cannot blame the media for reporting what was not done in justice, so your point is very valid, you know. Uh, we should correct what is right and wrong, not just go after the media who reports the truth. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rohan Dattukar, the former chairman of the EDB and Tourism. <coughs> I think the thinking of the IMF is Sri Lanka is a corrupt nation and that is why these laws are required if we are to be put on the right track. Uh, I now move my attention towards uh, Manjula Kajanayaka, Executive Director of the Institute for Democratic Reforms and Electoral Studies. Thanks, Samir. Thanks for uh, inviting and having me in this uh, conversation. So when it comes to media regulations, actually, when it comes to this uh, draft, I would like to ask two specific questions. The first one is actually, don't we have sufficient laws to tackle media industry? The second one is actually, are we utilizing existing laws in an effective way? OK, then when if we can answer, find answers for these two questions, actually we can uh, sort out uh, what is in, in, in this uh, specific draft. Bhavani correctly mentioned actually, this is something actually, yes, it is not a bill, even it is a draft. My understanding is actually that this is, this is a very vague draft as well as uh, copy-paste, actually it is something copy-paste. Okay? I can uh, prove in la later. Because uh, but whoever has copied it, Manjula, has forgot to uh, look at the spellings of this uh, yes, draft no, question. No, yes, this, this, this is a serious <coughs> document. No, that there are, uh, at least ten uh, spelling, spelling mistakes. mistakes yeah. Indeed, so, yeah. definitely, I'm definitely. Wondering who wrote this? Yeah. Okay, Wh whoever copied it has been done a good <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah, the other thing is actually then actually since uh, I'm an election observer and researcher, actually representing citizens, my first concern is that actually, yes, this is a draft. I saw that uh, some of uh, media team actually they have requested uh, specifically that they need they need the translation of translation of this draft actually Sinhala and uh, Tamil. The thing is actually yes, there is an English draft actually when it comes to the translation process, we don't know what they are going to present. I mean, we know that there are many controversial uh, laws as well as draft there are. Then, when it comes to regulations, actually, let me to quote uh, Winston Churchill. So Winston Churchill actually once he said, 
if you make 10,000 regulations, you destroy all respect for the law. Okay? He said like that. Then, in current current situation, what I see that actually the uh, actually professor earlier mentioned regarding the bill, they go, they uh, came 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 up at the 1997. When it comes to the that uh, bill presented 1997, actually, that the panel of commission, I mean the members of commission, when Look at the names, the designation of those uh, commission members actually just like mini cabinet okay uh, the of the uh, government I mean they have they have appointed uh, they are going to appoint uh, secretaries to media, education, post, defense that that is the context that is the uh, structure of that particular commission. okay after that when it comes to this particular draft, let me to say, this is just like a branch of president's office. Who are they appointing? Appointing authority. Okay, he, they are going to appoint the two person from the officially, mm. as well as the president will appoint other three person. Mm. When it comparing with 20, 20th amendment to the constitution actually, I would like to compare that the same sentiment echoing uh, what 20th amendment has in the uh, when when regarding uh, regarding the uh, appointing authority actually that mean we always suffer i mean uh, as a nation we have we have suffered enough through the executive presidency now it seems that through the through this bill also actually it is more strengthening the executive presidency uh, through this bill mm. that is uh, that is one of my uh, serious concern and other th other thing is actually yes we, though we are living in a digital era, actually, still according to the SLPI research I recently referred, uh, still 64.8 people are consuming, actually interested to having news through the television, not social media, even now. Then this is a big industry, at, as uh, Dr. Atukorala said. Okay, then. Actually, you can't, you can't, you can't control this. Just imposing regulations. Mm. There should be a different culture to regulate this. Then we can talk about later on. But uh, this is, I think, my my conclusion is actually this is a very vague document, and also uh, this is something actually uh, not required at this very right moment. Thank you very much, uh, Manjula Janaka. Executive Director of the Institute for Democratic Reforms and Electoral Studies. Uh, Niresh, shall we get the ball rolling today? Yes. Because you're the only one who's uh, <coughs> flanked uh, onto my left today. That's right. So, Shamir, uh, Manjula referred to how vague this, uh, this so-called white paper or draft bill is. And, um, you know, I've been a journalist for 34 years and I've read this from cover to cover about five times and if this bill is passed there is nothing that we can report on the news absolutely nothing let me give you an example um, uh, section 3 talks about uh, any matter uh, which that may lead to a threat to the national economy now that is so broad that is so vast so if the stock market crashes tomorrow, can we report it? Not according to this, because we would be threatening the national economy further by disseminating that information. So we can't re report that. Uh, okay? Yeah. So, However, we shouldn't forget actually this uh, uh, headed by the Minister of Justice and there are, there are, there's a uh, cabinet subcommittee to draft this, no? So, no, but, but, but what is appalling, uh, Niresh, is the fact that uh, parliamentarians, uh, head of states, go to parliament and then say that they will shut down the country's stock market and then they go scot-free and the stock market, um, uh, the results that came out in the next few days were very, very bad. So in a situation like that, uh, how broad are these words, national security, national economy and public order? And, and yeah. this leads to, Shamir, the fact that um, how is the public going to get this information mm. uh, they would have to um, rely 
solely on social media, which is, it's chaos. Social media, anyone can get on social media and write under any pseudonym and just uh, pass off misinformation. We as broadcasters, on the other hand, have, we are responsible, uh, responsible. We are in a particular location. We are registered. Uh, our journalists are registered. Uh, and we uh, operate within the law. So now the direct result, or if this bill becomes law, would be a stifling of the free flow of information. Uh, because how are we to um, broadcasters to uh, risk our licenses, to risk uh, journalists being uh, hauled up to the CID and so on, just by reporting on the stock market. So what do you think, uh, Angela? Uh, of Two that things, aspect? actually. Before answering that question, actually, I forgot to mention the specific things. That means uh, we are heading to uh, uh, time, actually, no elections, OK? Then uh, there are two elections already postponed, provincial council and local government. Then uh, it seems that government is going to have a national election. We don't know that they, they are, their intention has uh, changed. Anyway, actually, the uh, previously what we understood that uh, they are going to have a national election. Okay, then if, if they are going to have such election, uh, stopping other elections, actually they need to shut them out of watchdogs. That is the one thing actually they can use as a tool to stop it actually when you, if you can read this draft very carefully, actually they can, I mean the, the normal natural justice is that you can, you can stop, you can shut any, not media institution, anything actually, after a after fair, fair trial, no? But actually while going the investigation going on they have a power i mean the in investigation commission finally the commission has a power to stop it my th my answer is actually my take on, on that, that that is that that when it comes to an election time it is very easy to do something i mean not even uh, shut the uh, close close down the media organization i mean at least they can threat finally the basic intention of introducing this bill is actually that convert private media as state media, what they are right now. So, Bhavan, if you look at it, um, don't you think that the government is trying to send a strong signal to the media? If you do not act based on the whim and fancy of the government in power, we will cancel your license. Isn't that what this means? Looks like it. I mean, and I... I mean, this is the thing, Shamir, when I read this, I actually wondered, is this actually a document coming from the government? Because apart from what Niresh said about the spelling issues, all of that, just the, the, the direction this is going, mm. it, they're not even hiding the fact they're trying to control any form of alternative viewpoints. There's, there's nothing here if, I mean, a, it's extremely, the terminology is so vague and so broad. Who is to decide what national security is? Who is to decide what national economy is? Who is to decide public order? Now, we can always look at our recent history in Sri Lanka. I mean, last year what happened with the, the crisis, we had thousands of people coming to the streets. Now, if something like this happens, and a broadcaster shows images of people getting to the streets peacefully protesting can the commission decide that that's a threat to public order that it's a threat to national security that's one now we had the lockdown there were questions raised including by some of us about the legality of some of the measures taken at this point mm. there were people who were arrested for raising questions at that time now, in a situation such as that, when people also worry, there's uncertainty. If a broadcaster raises questions about the legality of certain measures, would that come under a threat to public order, national security? So just looking at the recent events, mm -hmm. just a critique of what 
the government of the day is trying to do could raise issues where the commission puts an interim directive or cancels a license. I mean, such broad base. Now, there is one, I mean, I think one of the things we need to look at is what is the, the form of the commission. That raises questions. Who appoints? What is the role of the Constitution Council? All of that. And while there's seemingly a role for the Constitution Council, if you really look at it, it's the executive who appoints even though it says approval of the mm. Constitution Council. But the executive can also remove by informing the Constitution Council. That's also very problematic. Now, that's the process of appointment. But the weak terminology, who decides what these terms are? You know, yeah, who but, is going to yeah, drive but, those yeah, decisions? But if you look at it, uh, the secretary of the ministry of the minister is uh, an ex official member. In the, uh, in the commission in question. Who appoints a secretary of the ministry, uh, particular minister, ministry? It's the president. Exactly. Uh, the director general of the Tele telecommunications regulatory authority has been appointed by the president. president. So number two uh, is also... By the minister. By the minister. At but this point, uh, absolutely. it's the, it, it, yeah, uh, president, so the but president. It may be somebody... It may be, yeah. But, it, but at the end of the day, invariably becomes the president who appoints. So all five members are invariably appointed by the president. And how independent is the commission if that is the case? That, that's a valid yeah. question. And I think the other thing is it says the quorum of the commission is three. So say, I mean, let's, assume, let's yeah. assume there are some independent appointees. If two don't turn up and it's only three, and those are the three that the president had a direct role in appointing, I mean, is that then uh, decisions made at that time? Is it going to be an independent process and questions? And the implications of those decisions, the consequences of those decisions are so, so broad based and can really shut down dissent. And this is why I keep coming back, not to kind of be the lawyer, but you know, we have had decades of jurisprudence from our own Supreme Court that protects fundamental rights, the freedom of expression, that says that dissent is not just something we take for granted, that dissent is not just something that is there to survive. It needs to be encouraged. There needs to be a space for dissent in Sri Lanka. What we see, not just with this, but a whole series of measures by this government shows that dissent is going to be, there is no space for dissent. So this is, I mean, this is just the most latest tool in a whole series so of tools. Uh, Bhavan, you speak about the appointment of the uh, members of commission, but even the removal That's what I uh, mentioned. is also By the appalling. President. Uh, if you look at it, uh, if you look at what happened in the last few weeks, the removal of Janaka Ratnayaka as the Public Utilities Commission Chairman, it really raised an, raised an eyebrow uh, in uh, every cult of society because uh, people were of the opinion that he was doing his job and he was removed uh, through a, a public uh, a, a vote in parliament. And this shows that the government or the president in power can just remove him at his uh, discretion. Uh, so By informing the constitution. Yeah, council. by informing like the constitution council. council. But, but could I add to yeah. address your question directly? I think that the general objects of an uh, act are, I mean, they, they are important, powerful, etc. But what you should be really looking at are the terms of the licenses which are yet to be drafted. Because it's under the terms of the licenses that a license will be cancelled, suspended, actions will be taken. There is also another uh, worrisome subject which is regulation. So those regulations that I mentioned here could include, uh, they use terms like uh, codes of ethics. They use, mm. it's almost like a translation problem. Code of ethics, code of Can something, that. code of something. They, they use three terms for the same thing, more or less. Mm. Uh, that would be the, the more powerful one, in my opinion, because that would have to be in place. Uh, now, one of the things that we were trying to avoid in our committee was to give the minister the authority to make regulations regarding content. What we said is the content, the codes of practice must be arrived at through public hearings with the participation both of the 
uh, broadcasters or whoever was concerned in that particular class and the members of the general public and approved by the, the commission and then included as a license term. So that's a form of co-regulation if you look at the technical term. So it's not just self-regulation which has failed in Sri Lanka but self-regulation backed up by the fact that it's part of a license. But how that came about is through a process that did not involve the minister or politicians in any form. So that's sort of one distinction we had to make. And the other thing is that the interpretation of that and the taking of action, etc., would require an independent commission. Now, I'm agreed with Bhavani that there is no independent commission. And I would like to add one more thing, which is that uh, I have uh, been involved in uh, enforcing licenses. Uh, and I've also been on a commission where the chairman was ex officio the secretary of the ministry. Now, when you have a secretary as ex officio chairman, uh, there are two problems. That is, whenever the secretary is changed, a new person comes in. There's no appointment, new human being comes because it's ex officio. And secondly, the secretary of the ministry is the chief accounting officer of all the entities that are under it. That means that it's an extremely powerful position. So even though this uh, discussion draft talks about uh, a chairman being appointed, I don't think uh, a chairman could be there overriding the secretary. The secretary will be the de facto chairman. So I think those are the two things that we need to look at. Because if you look at regulations, mm. even if the commission, this not independent commission, were to come up with codes of practice or codes of ethics or whatever they call it and wants to put them into regulations, they'll have to go through the minister. And the minute you have to go through the minister, the minister can say, I don't like that sentence. Mm. I don't, I'd like that worded differently. So it essentially becomes the minister's instrument because I've done these things. I've sent regulations through. So then it becomes the minister's instrument. And if you look at the Atukorala decision, these are specifically the things that are yeah. Uh, referred to yeah. as being uh, inappropriate for um, media uh, in a democratic society. Right. Uh, so that is what we have to look at. So I, I don't think this can be uh, remedied or retrieved. Uh, but we have to understand uh, the basic architecture, which is problematic. So Professor Samarjiva, uh, you write an article uh, on the 5th of uh, June, um, titled, What Media Regulation is Not. Yeah. And then in your conclusion, you say, a return to the drawing board appears the only appropriate cause of action with regard to this bill in question. So do you mean to say that certain provisions of the bill should be intact, but certain provisions return should be... Return to the drawing board means... Complete... Take it away, start again. Away. Uh, I have actually over that over that uh, week I have come to sort of revise my or fine tune my opinion, which is that I understand that uh, some references have been made to our report in various uh, presentations and conversations. So now my my suggestion, which I did publish in my single article so over the weekend, mm. was why don't you put this? This is somebody said singular and translations are not available. This is available in singular Tamil and English. It's a report uh, which justifies it. It has footnotes, uh, the whole works. Uh, it has even references to Milton's Aryopagetika. Uh, and it has got sections. It has got uh, things people can discuss, definitions. Uh, this one, for example, the interpretation section defines the minister. I mean, do you really need to define a minister? And nothing else. So uh, this has got all these definitions. It for example, even distinguishes between conventional broadcasting and retransmission. Because that retransmission is a different beast altogether. Mm. A cable and satellite uh, retransmission. So it says that's a different class. Right. Uh, Professor mm. Shiva, I, I want to drag your attention uh, to what happened uh, during the last couple of days. Uh, you, alongside with the two others, went to the CID uh, recently uh, over an issue that cropped up with regard to how media ethics uh, revolve around as far as broadcast journalism is concerned 
and then uh, there was reference made to two uh, uh, private media institutions uh, by one of your colleagues who were accompanying you uh, at that uh, instance. Uh, can you bring in a regulation just because two people out of 18 broadcasters or 44 broadcasters as Rohanta spoke, uh, spoke about, uh, just to penalize two people who are not in line, who are either crooked or either mm. not doing their job uh, based on the social norms of a country, uh, to penalize the rest of the media fraternity. I don't think that there's any, any, any attempt or intention or anything to say that just because one person violates, you should penalize everybody. I don't think, I think that's a real stretch to argue that. But I think it does demonstrate that we are living in a country where religious and ethnic hatred and disaffection can be fostered by the actions of media, not only the mainstream media, but in that case, also some of the YouTube channels. Now, back in, uh, I, perhaps people didn't pay enough attention to it, I was speaking at a, at a press conference where I said, you know, things are pretty, uh, sensitive and pretty dangerous situation we are in. Uh, things seem to be stoked up and fired up. Uh, therefore, why doesn't everybody cool down and step back and be cautious about what's going on? Because that was a judgment from a very senior uh, politician with a lot of experience. That was his judgment and I agreed with it. Now, uh, <clears throat> my younger colleagues don't have that level of patience. And my younger colleagues said, you know, look at all this bad stuff that's being done. Uh, we should, uh, they didn't refer to a particular act. They didn't ask the CID to come up with uh, a law or anything mm -hmm. like that. They just said, this is bad. Do something about it, right? If you're doing things about uh, Natasha, Idrisuria, uh, why don't you also do something about the people who are taking what she said, excerpting it, framing it, and using it in the month of May when she spoke in the month of April? So I think that's a separate argument, mm. uh, not quite connected to this. Mm. But I think it does illustrate the fact. So if you look at the, the, what happened to Dr. Shafi, we have to admit, I mean, again, I would say in that case, we would have to admit that the print media, uh, which is not part of this conversation, will have to be also held accountable, that here you have a professional, a human being, a family, and it basically destroyed by media action. I mean, there were human beings whose voices were amplified, but quite a lot of it was plain and pure media action. So I think I, I, I would use both these cases to argue that it's a, it's a justification for media regulation. It has to be there in this country. It has to be there. 15th, uh, art, Article 15 of the Constitution says that we shouldn't have freedom of speech that forces people to be, you know, ethnic, religious hatred, etc. That, uh, I think, is necessary. Uh, Arantha, the bill speaks about renewing licenses of an organization, a media organization, <coughs> in a period of 12 months, in a year. Uh, how prudent is this decision? Because you know, opening up a company um, is a tall task. It's <coughs> not easy. There's a lot of money that is being put in. There's a lot of capital expenditure that comes into play. Uh, with the current rate of interest uh, that we're talking about in Sri Lanka, uh, hitting the, uh, the two-digit uh, number at the moment, it's not easy. Uh, even to recuperate your return on investment on a particular capital expenditure would take you at least 15 or 20 years, given the current uh, context as far as interest rates are concerned. So how prudent is it to be renewing licenses for a year? You build the banks. Uh, lend money uh, if the licenses are to be uh, renewed every year. What about the people who are working in these organizations, like the journalists? What what about their future? How, how do you view this? If I may add to that, Shamir, uh, media institutions in, in any uh, medium, uh, be it print or electronic, uh, don't make a lot of money and it takes many years to become profitable. So uh, the, what a bill such as this would do is to uh, dissuade investors uh, from investing in media at all uh, because it, it's very costly 
Um, when you talk about transmitters, camera equipment, or all the other paraphernalia, training of journalists, uh, it, it's very manpower uh, intensive. So uh, why would a businessman invest in it at all if he stands to get his um, license cancelled um, within a year? Within a year. See, that's exactly the point that I'm also arguing, Shamir. For instance, you know, when a country is driving towards, you know, bouncing back, you know, you would look at models around the world, how companies and how countries developed. Mm. And we don't see this kind of strategies being implemented by those countries. For example, if you take Croatia, came out of a war between 1990 and 1995, and, and it was a bitter war, just like Sri Lanka. And then, you know, the leadership said, let's go and connect with the world. They opened 197 embassies around the world. You know, they came out with a uh, Croatian uh, product um, uh, logo for every single product. They got people to come and invest on communication, media, talk about the goodness of the country. If there's anything bad, let's highlight it. So that then what happens is entrepreneurship starts building at a discussion level. <coughs> And new th thinking came in, and today, if you take a brand like Croatia, you know, it's one of the top countries in Europe. Their exports have almost gone up to about 20 billion. Their tourism has gone up to about 6 billion euro. How? Because the brand was built. Now, when you, do, uh, when you come out with a strategy like this, you are trying to stifle people's discussion. You have a situation where the private sector already is mum when it comes to uh, discussion of policy. If you take the chambers, they would never come round a table and discuss. Okay? When you put in a clause like this, they shut. So what happens is, the point you mentioned, Shamir, where you, know, you would like to invest on uh, new di digital technologies, you, and, and, and then you know, you're going to make new TV commercials. You, know, you don't only just do broadcasting. And, and you're going to you know, build brands, build enterprises, all that comes from a media station. Now, if you don't do that and allow that to happen, and you're saying that every 12 months I'm going to come and re-evaluate your licenses, you start playing uh, cautious. How do you cut through the clutter when you have so much of competition? Mm -hmm. At least if the competition is reduced and said, okay, I'm going to have only two stations, two media stations, you know, then you would give a, some degree of um, size of market to say I'm investing, and I, I, I know that I need to be careful in what I say. But here when you have 18 TV stations, each station wants to be up against a competitor brand, you have to take that leap. Otherwise, you're not going to get the eyeballs to watch it. Mm. So, so, and then if you make one mistake, you know, you're gone. So, it, it's the whole spirit of... So um, what, about the, what, what about the future of journalists, <coughs> uh, Rohanda, now? Uh, we all speak about uh, attracting FDIs is very important and imperative for Sri Lanka, which has a dire economic condition even now. When foreigners see Sri Lanka bring in regulations of this sort, do you think Sri Lanka would be an attractive <coughs> hub? See, what will, what's going to happen is that the, 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 the freedom of speech is not there. Uh, and end of the day, Simon Arnold, the guy who talks about building a brand, using journalists, bloggers, and you know the news media, they always say that the best form of advertising is the people and what people say. They don't say talk about beautiful advertising by tourism and exports going all over with this flimsy advertising. It doesn't build brands. It's what the voice of the people what it says. Now, if the voice of the people and the private sector is not being allowed to talk freely good and bad, just like what happens on maybe NDTV or in, in India, you know, where everybody is allowed to say, you know, you, you, you stifle uh, economic activity. So, so my when, point when you is look at uh, Indian uh, media, <coughs> they're highly critical. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, you, don't you think there's uh, quite a lot of repression going on in the Indian media as well? Yes, and but that the private media have been tamed in the last few years? But is it uh, that professor, you see the grass being greener on the other side? No, Professor. The, uh, what I see is by sheer numbers, it's difficult for one party to try to control. I think we should uh, talk to some of yes, Kashmiri journalists yes. and media. Well, yes, there are certain. Yes, uh, Kashmir is a is a whole different ball game. 
but it's difficult to control when you have thousands of journalists, hundreds of media institutions, especially localized ones. Uh, and there is a, a better chance for a free flow of information. So it's not just about freedom of expression, it is free flow of uh, information to uh, the audience, which now, now we were talking about businesses, chambers, uh, companies. How are they going to get a free flow of information if the information is stifled? But if you look at the situation now, I mean, I know this is terrible, right? What's being proposed is awful. But if you look at the situation now, I mean, when an investor would look at the media environment today, where licenses have been arbitrarily overnight cancelled in a number of cases, and then there were no proper inquiries, no proper hearings, no nothing. And uh, you can also see that, you know, some licenses don't have terms, some have arbitrary terms, uh, and so on. It seems quite chaotic. So I have a feeling that, you know, what we now have is a kind of a deal-based uh, arrangement, not a proper uh, licensing arrangement at the present time, which is, uh, I would say, somewhat problematic for investment as well. Rohan, I think <coughs> your point is valid. That's what I said. You know, when you have 18 TV stations attacking 21 million people, you know, how do you target? How do you create a niche? So there is some degree of regulations that are required to actually uplift the industry. You know, I, I agree with what, I, what, is, what Rohan is, the point she is making. But then, you know, what happens is, if you're go th this particular act is about, not about development, it's about saying, be cautious of what you say. You know, and, and, and if the truth is being told and it's not in right, you, you have a chance of your <coughs> license getting annulled. Now, now that is what so the there is. No, is. It, it's completely a stick approach the government is uh, trying to do. So, um, Manjula, getting back into what, what you said, you say that uh, a national election uh, is uh, what the government is proposing at this point of time. Uh, two elections have been postponed, the provincial council election <coughs> and the local government elections. Uh, so do you think that a piece of paper like this is the way out for any government? Wouldn't this uh, impact their popularity moving towards uh, an election that pro probably would uh, take place next year or a few uh, months from now? Just to add one thing there uh, for Manjula to uh, perhaps uh, discuss is, uh, isn't it rather ridiculous that we are talking about something as serious as the drafting of laws uh, being dependent on somebody's election, which may or may not happen, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the pros and cons of uh, various parties winning or losing. I mean, uh, that, that's Isn't absolutely, that yeah. uh, absolutely <laughs> the most horrendous approach to, uh, to making of law. Uh, I mean, Professor uh, Rohan uh, uh, articulated how the, the process Right, from 1997, the, you know, the various committees and so on that, uh, that you sat on. And, and uh, you know, that it's a, it's a, lawmaking is a process. Whereas here, you know, okay, we'll have an election, so let's bring in this law. Uh, let's not have an election, so, you know, let's not uh, change the law. And, and the other and, point is, I don't yeah. know how these, how these drugs bills are popping out. <laughs> you know, a few weeks ago, we speak about an anti-terrorism bill. <laughs> days after Dinesh, back back. you have this. <laughs> but at least in those cases, you see, we had a counter-terrorism uh, bill in 2018 or thereabouts. Yeah, uh, you know, there are significant and problematic uh, diver de deviations yeah. from that. But there was something that had been done. Uh, in the case of the corruption, anti-corruption bill, there was a document. And I want yeah. to point out that it has actually gone through uh, a constitutional uh, mm. council uh, court uh, on, a review, constitutional court review, and it has just mm. to be put on the order paper. So it's not like it's not coming, it's yeah. on the way. Uh, here, while our report existed, they decided to just disregard it completely and write their own thing. Uh, I, I thought you were going to say it had been cut yeah. and paste from here. I can tell you, it's not cut and paste from here. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> if it was cut and paste from here, those definitions, etc. The article would be different. Yeah. Would be <laughs> Shamil, Shamil, I, I, would, I would argue if yeah. we can have the same passion towards economy development, mm. free trade agreement with China, you have a ferry that's operating, the air transfer is happening, now you have a cruise line, 
free trade is from 0.5 billion, it had gone to 0.8 billion for the last 10 years, mm. right? If you, the middle income in India is 500 million, mm. right? And they are saying, we want Sri Lankan products. Get the policies of that on the table, go there, discuss how we can make this 2 billion. I wish that passion was there. But the question is, it's not about... I mean, in 1991, India had the same problem, no? economic collapse. So the whole strategy was on the economy. But that passion doesn't exist in trade and commerce. So perhaps what we should blame is the Minister of Trade, who seems to be not working. While the Minister of Justice is churning it out. Oh, maybe, Mom, maybe the leadership maybe is... Maybe the guy is sort of hyperactive and oh, he's oh, just churning oh, them out. Or Rohan, you know, pretty much everything that's coming or, 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 from him. Or Rohan, he's, he's giving the said, leadership speech. Or Rohan, the leadership has certain pet areas. <laughs> no, but, but, but you ask, yeah, you ask yeah. actually that my concern is that the... I mean, my answer is that the... Right now, actually, government is not concerned on people's consent as well as, I mean, they are not thinking on people's rights right now. That's the thing. If so, actually, they are not going to sell uh, uh, telecom in a one package with the uh, Sri Lankan airline. No, I know that uh, Professor is writing more and more regarding that. But my, my I mean, if they are concerning on people's aspirations, actually, they will not going to sell in uh, telecom and uh, Sri Lankan airline actually in the same package. That's the thing. Regarding your specific questions, actually, my understanding is that government is not concerning on what you mentioned. Actually, they are concerning only how to win the elections. Then, what they understood, actually, media institutions and other entities are obstructing, may be obstructing to their uh, cause. That's the, that's, that's, that's the thing. Otherwise, actually, if they are, if they have a real, genuine effort, willingness to do this, there are four or five uh, acts already existing. Telecommunication Act, 1991, 1996. Uh, well, I would say that the, the, there's, I mean, Shafi's case mm, illustrates mm, the point. Mm, mm. Or even Natasha's case illustrates the point. The existing laws are inadequate. Yeah. They are quite unsatisfactory and do not give any remedies. The self-regulatory system for mm. print media has failed. Mm. So it, I don't think, I think the answer to your first question, yeah. you said, do we have the current laws? Are they adequate? Yeah. I, my answer is an unequivocal uh, uh, no. Dirish, correct me if I'm wrong. <coughs> the National Press Complaints Commission, um, is the, the, the regulations are uh, for the, the print media journalists, isn't it? Right. It's self-regulatory. The, self the, the yeah. Press self Complaints Commission. Press, press, press Complaints yes. Commission. Self-regulatory. Yes. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, what can I tell you? Has anybody taken action against Angaharu Loven Gadol? The absolute falsehoods that are propagated by the Divine newspaper? The attacks on, uh, on Shafi and the destruction of that family? Has anybody done anything? Has, has regulation worked? So, uh, so talk about <laughs> this bill in question, <laughs> uh, Manjula. Now, this, uh, the objectives of this bill, if you look at um, Preamble H, it says, issuing guidelines in respect of broadcasting to enhance the spiritual development and mental health of the people while safeguarding the social and cultural values and entertainment of the people. <coughs> Can you give me some clarity on this, Bhavani or Banjula for that? Yeah, that is, that is when something... When you say spiritual development, what, what do they envisage to achieve? <laughs> I mean, you're asking us, <laughs> because yeah. I, when I read this, I also <laughs> did wonder. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we all agree this is a very badly drafted piece of paper. I don't want to even say bill, because I don't think this, I mean, it's we have that. Qualifies, law. qualifies to become exactly, bill. Exactly, yeah. but <laughs> the, the, the approach to it, all of that, but uh, the point that was made about lawmaking, I think that's a very important question in Sri Lanka because we've, and not just this government, over the years, over the decades, I think that's a very problematic thing in terms of who drafts these bills, who decides on it, um, what's the purpose of these things. Now, with this and even with the anti-terror bill, just these two raises questions of who is really behind this process, who is sitting and drafting it. Now, publicly they say the Minister of Justice is part and parcel and, and doing it. But really, does he have the time to sit and draft this? And if he's the one who's drafting it, really they should 
review as to whether this kind of thing should be given to a Minister of Justice. But were I, the Minister of Justice competent to draft bills? A good at question. All? Good question. But these two that I mentioned, at least that we've looked at, came from that. I mean, his name is associated. So I think there needs to be really questions as to why that kind of process is happening. But really, all these bills are affecting people's rights, the citizen. Mm. Now, where does the citizen come into any of these processes? With the anti-terror law, they withdraw, or at least they're saying they're having consultations after they gazette it. Now with this, because there's a bit, bit of noise, they're saying this is not a bill, they're going to have it's a white conversation. Paper. It's a white paper, whatever it is. But why do you n not start with that? The consultations, looking at drafts, I mean, there are things that have been done before. So it seems like even though some of it goes through the Supreme Court, all of that, that's all forgotten. But I also want to make the point that Sri Lanka has a plethora of laws on so many things. Now, with because certain cases have been raised, the two arrests recently under the ICCPR, a comedian and a blogger, and Dr. Shafi's case and so many others, why, what has been used to target these particular individuals? What is the purpose of those cases? Now, one thing that comes out of all these cases is the ICCPR Act. The ICCPR Act has been used on the basis of religious racial harmony and creating um, particular issues, as the state would say, in terms of upsetting sensitivities. Now, then the question is, there, are, there is evidence of particular individuals inciting violence against communities, minorities, has action taken, been taken against them. Rohan raised the whole point of particular media institutions behind Dr. Shafi's case, but others as well. Has any action been taken? So, you know... But don't you think the existing laws in Sri Lanka allows you to take action against such uh, if, uh, if they want to take action, the law is there. So Has it's any about action been it's, taken it's against about, the media institution. It's no. about implementation. It's just yes. individuals. So and it's about selective. Is there any action taken against corruption? <laughs> so just individuals. Shakti Kasat Kumar, Ramzi Rasik, just just innocent individuals who are incapable of defending themselves. The big boys have not been taken taken down. That was why we said, hey. It is basically the problem too. of proper implementation of law, no? And Shamir, we must do something that's going to benefit the country, no? And the brand for people to come and say, here's a country which is bankrupt, but I'm here going to come and engage. No, but but, but Ron, the, my question is, Niresh, my, my, my question is, we are a country that now needs to talk about the Express Pearl matter, which can bring in six billion plus US dollars to the country. What are we talking about? We're talking about a comedian, we're talking about a blogger, we're talking about a bill or a white paper, whatever you may call it, or a set of half sheets. You know, we're talking about all this. This is not what we should be talking about. We should be talking about progressive things. How to revive the country's economy. How are we going to uh, move out of this situation of our, our dire economic conditions right now? What is happening with the US dollar? Uh, aren't those the real problems that we need to be talking about? I, think I would disagree with you. I think a situation like now, where uh, various individuals, the Balanguda Kasapahimi and various other people, have been able to mobilize the power of the state and their actions have been amplified by certain segments of the media, have the potential to completely derail any kind of economic activity reforms that we are going to take place. They have the ability. I think we don't have to talk about much. 1983, when we had an investors conference in the BMICH and Chandi Chanmugam was speaking to them, somebody was setting fire to his house. 1983 July, mm. right? That was a, one of our most esteemed uh, senior government officials. And that derailed that entire economic uh, growth strategy that was there at that point. So I, I personally believe that uh, this is not a misplaced priority. Yeah, I think we need to have um, 
ways of dealing with uh, <coughs> not this solution. Well, I believe we need to have, have it. But, and I'm not poor. I think we, this, I mean, how long can we postpone this? But we have been postponing it for now 40 years. Yes, but shouldn't the, the first step be to uh, uh, use the existing laws against the person who burnt the house rather than the, the media which uh, publicized it? Is well, there the message? I think, the well, day. it all depends because I, again, I go back to Natasha's case where, you know, she made whatever statement she made. I listened to it. I don't think there's a iota of a problem with it. That was in April. The Absolutely. whole thing blows up because certain media institutions decide to blow it up. So you could say that the actor responsible for creating this conflagration is not her, it's the people who decided to blow it up. So I, I, I disagree. Uh, I think uh, that we have to have a decent, civilized media environment uh, in order to, to uh, you know, get the country back on the right track. I don't think it's simply a case of just focusing on trade agreements and various other things. Because the minute you start doing this thing, there'll be somebody saying, Grata Vikuruna, this, that, whatever, and it'll be another configuration. Yeah, there will be a problem. You should have responsible media behavior uh, at all times. Not only now, but I think this is long overdue. It should have been done in 1997, 98. It would have been much easier to handle the the, the professor. The when you conflict. speak about when you speak about um, anti-nationalistic rhetoric, uh, we probably could buy your argument saying there needs to be some sort of regulation. But when it comes to uh, an issue with regard to uh, national economy uh, that needs two sides of the coin to express views and debate, to argue, and to find out ways, uh, the best fit yeah. for the country. Then, as I said, I I, I would it, disagree. I think uh, I've that, been that it's important. at the end of uh, on on various sides of very nasty uh, economic debates, and uh, the GMOA, for example, has said publicly at uh, on a TV station that I should be put in jail for my views, right? He should be put in jail for his views. So uh, I obviously like uh, the the give and take of uh, debate. Uh, and I think it should be encouraged. That's the only way we will we'll get, get anywhere. But not at the cost of setting fire to the country. I don't think I've been engaged in that. I've been engaged in economic debate. This is the GMOA who are experts in fertilizer, of course. Well, they <coughs> before they became experts in fertilizer, they wanted me to be put in jail. No, we are certainly glad that you were not. <laughs> no, Rohan, what, 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 what is your take, Bhavani now? Uh, you represent a, a civil rights movement and uh, you all champion freedom of expression, democracy, freedom of uh, speech and all that and more. Do you agree with the analogy of uh, or the ideas of uh, Professor Samarjeeva? Meaning which ones? Uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, <coughs> uh, having regulations in place uh, with regard to uh, regulate the media in the country? I think regulations are important. I mean, I'd, I'd be surprised if someone says there shouldn't be any regulation considering the fact what we've seen in the past in terms of the, the noise that's generated but also the consequences of that noise. But how do you regulate? Who regulates? So in a way, it's you need an independent and emphasis on independent mechanism to do it. I don't think that mechanism is provided in this document. That's a starting point. Then how do you come to those regulations, all of that? What's the process? Kind of, it shouldn't be a kind of one-sided process. How do you engage with the different stakeholders but also give confidence to the different actors that this is a process that's not going to be targeting mm. institutions or individuals for reporting, for sharing the information. All of that is important, but if there is any semblance that that regulation power is to be used for political gain, to target individuals for having a different perspective, then it's extremely problematic. That's when the weaponizing starts. And in Sri Lanka, and I think we're not, the history speaks for itself, how media institutions 
individuals have been targeted. So any proposal that comes about needs to factor those things in. What we're talking about seems to be in some other world. Mm. And it's such a kind of Orwellian concept that this is to control. This is not to have a debate or a, or a discussion and disagreement. This is to say this is what's going to be the case in terms of national security, national economy, public order. And if anything doesn't meet our standards, you're going to get shut down. Regulations is not that. Regulations is to say you have to be responsible in the way it's done. But you can have a different way of doing it. You can have a different opinion in doing it. That debate is imp extremely important in a democracy. This kind of tool, and not just this, the things we've seen in the recent couple of months is not leading to a functioning democracy. It's authoritarianism. Samir, yeah, just to add, add it what uh, Bhavani correctly mentioned, actually. Yes, regulation is, uh, yes, uh, somewhat we need. That's why media regulations has uh, prepared by election commission during election times, actually. It is true. Because actually the, today is the special day, I think uh, that I, I, I referred the uh, cabinet memorandum today that they have mentioned that the, they are going to uh, table the media regulations uh, during election times uh, in future, mm -hmm. maybe near future. That's why actually they have prepared election uh, uh, media guidelines during election times, it is true. But the question is that not only media channel, let's say one example uh, that uh, uh, professor uh, took uh, many examples but let me to say one thing now media di director general of media the media ministry okay now he is a previous uh, journalist uh, who served for the president uh, during his uh, campaign period times uh, during election times He's, he 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 publicly said that I, what election commission uh, did during election time is totally incorrect. Actually, they have violated election law, uh, 1991 uh, parliamentary election law. Who said? Said by the media director general. Okay, appointed by the president. Recently, during uh, election times, uh, local government elections time, nomination time. But this is the president's media division, director general, right? Uh, yes. Mm. No, director general media, no, the, the uh, department of uh, media. Mm. Okay. Then Department of information. Yeah, information. Government information. Director right. general oh. of, yeah. <coughs> government Mr. information. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. He did it. Okay. <laughs> if we are talking on these things, actually, actually, we have to mention this also, but no, no one has concern. And no, finally, what happened, actually, President mentioned, he quote that what he mentioned uh, in the, uh, during the parliamentary session. That is what happened earlier. Then, that something, that kind of things can be happened. But that's why we are talking on media regulation during election times. It is a, it is a basic, critical <coughs> part. But one, the failure of this uh, specific document, actually they have not mentioned anything regarding that also. If they had a genuine idea, actually they can mention on election that the uh, media guideline also. That another one point, 5C, article number 5C of the Right to Information Act, hmm, they have mentioned comprehensively the dis disclosure of such information would cause serious prejudice to the economy of Sri Lanka by disclosing premature, uh, prematurely decisions to change or continue government economic or financial policies relating to. And they have mentioned exchange rates, the regulation of banking or credit, taxation, the stability the control, many things. Okay? Okay. Yeah, right. okay, they have mentioned many things in the uh, Right to Information Act. All right. All right. They have yes. taken only the part <laughs> economy. Okay, the word only the mm. economy. But in this act, actually, they have they have elaborated what kind of what kind of violation related to the economy. Mm. <laughs> the thing is, that's why I'm, I I repeatedly said that the vagueness of this uh, document actually, when you are mentioning economy. What the regulation actually? You can do anything. That's the, that's the problematic area. Well, the, the, the problem I think uh, we've seen uh, over the last several months, Shamir, is yeah. that these willy-nilly drafts are being uh, put out without any process. And uh, Manjula, you mentioned the Right to Information Act, and 
uh, I believe the CPA was heavily involved in that and that took uh, nearly 18 to 20 years uh, before it came out. Well, I don't think that process was public enough. I think, I think we have to get back to the white paper model. Mm. Because I was, I was giving input and it was imp almost impossible to get the input in. So I was publishing all my comments uh, because the, the committee was not uh, quite receptive. So, so uh, uh, Professor, now taking a look at this uh, paper, it's coming in as a white paper. What made you... Nobody calls it a white paper. Yeah, okay, I wish it was a white paper. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but my, 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 my point is, <coughs> how do we know that the people's aspirations, the media institutions' wishes are embedded in this piece of paper? Because you say that you, uh, in terms of the Right to Information Act, you have been uh, submitting your proposals uh, right throughout and they were not receptive. So well, what makes you think that the government would be receptive to... Uh, uh, to the media institutions uh, when it comes to this piece of paper as well because they have a they have convincingly a majority in parliament right now well and you know there are there are i mean i mean this policy business and we know what we can do and we know the imperfections of the system so i'll use another example i mean i can go back to the right to information which i thought was done in a rather opaque manner uh, but uh, because you know, if you're, you're lucky, if you were inside that committee, you were in, but those who were not like me uh, were not in, and there were few public consultations and so on. Now, the Data Protection Act, which is again, if you really, I mean, it's kind of historic, but it covers everything, like right to information. It has a very pervasive impact on, on everything in society, government organizations and private organizations, everybody, it covers. What we did, and I had to give credit to the minister at the time, the state minister, was that he got the process started in about January with a drafting committee. And I think by May or June, uh, they put out something called a framework document, which had uh, sections, subsections, and so on, which looked like an act. But they called it, they said, we are not allowed to call it a bill. It's a framework document. And they had substantive responses. They held public consultations. A uh, lot of people from the industry, uh, the computer and, I, and uh, BPO industry, came and made representations. And you, I could see, because I was tracking it, well, I was not on the committee, I could see that it was being changed. And it kept being changed, now we are talking in 2019, and it was about to go, to go for cabinet approval when the government changed. Now Mr. Ali Sabri, the subsequent minister, took that document, I don't know what he did to it, but he gazetted it, and then even after he gazetted it, he made some substantive changes, right? So that was a process that uh, that was somewhat closer to a white paper model than anything I have seen in recent times. We have to go back to the white paper model, particularly for laws right, like but, this. But it is a process rather than just parachuting in a document which then we waste a lot of time trying to figure out what in the world this is all about. So I can tell you that the, the, the minister who commissioned our report, his intention was to have a have public consultation. Who, who was the minister in charge? Mr. Uh, Samaria, Mangala Samaria. Mm. So that's why these things were translated and so on and so forth. They, you know, they were getting ready for a public consultation. Now I was not part of the ministry. I was outside. I was not involved in the mechanics of it. My job was to do it and give it. And I gave it. Uh, but their intention was to have public uh, consultations. Rohan, uh, uh, <coughs> the business community, you know, uh, do you think they are serious about such regulations? Now, if you look at, if you look at the chamber, the national chamber, you look at, I think there are uh, thousands, there are at least uh, a dozen chambers in Sri Lanka right now. Uh, are they concerned about um, issues of this sort? See, Shamil, when you're dealing with money, you always develop a strategy which is competitive because at the end of the day, if you're not competitive, you cannot get a consumer to buy your brand. So, for whatever reasons, even though the environment was continuously putting shocks on business communities, you guys also are in business. You know, we somehow or other get ourselves, get our act together and we survive. And we even thrive, to be very honest. There are companies who are doing really good. Some companies. Yeah. <laughs> All right? I mean... Very subjective. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. sharp. You know, you're, you can survive. Even with a negative 7.8% GDP growth decline, 
and three percent again come in this month, this year. Year to year, companies can survive, yeah. but not the small and SMEs, medium scale right? uh, enterprises. So the point I'm just trying to get at is that, you know, the business community loses total confidence when you have these documents that come. You know, so so they don't take government regulation seriously. I mean, end of the day, we say that we have the 25 best scientists. I saw something going up on viral media. Ten, ten. Yeah, ten. Mm. We, in we, Asia. We say that we are the best brains. We can't even put a simple document out like this. I mean, end of the day, what is this economy? We are crashed. We are bankrupt. I mean, even if you take 1960 plan or if you take a Malaysian plan of 1950s, it will be much better than us. So my question is that why is it that a member of this uh, discussion says, I have a plan that is much better than this? It's, if this is what the government is saying that we are going to put together, why is it that they can't get a group of people, use the best practices of some other country, bring it in, have the consultations, do the changes that are required. Mm. If this document cannot be brought in, private sector loses mm. confidence in this do whole you process. Think, do you think there is dictatorship, <coughs> authoritarianism in Sri Lanka at this moment of time? See, sometimes you require that kind of leadership style to get a company which is in bad shape like what Sri Lanka is in. But then at least now that stabilization is coming, get the best brains into the table, you know, put something right even now. If, if, if continuously we have this kind of documents that are brought in, the answer to your question somewhere is private sector loses total interest. No, no, I'm not talking about you private know? sector. I'm talking about, I'm ta talking about the wishes of uh, the president in power because at the end of the day he's responsible. He he heads the cabinet. When such documents come into play, many might have the opinion that he's trying to safeguard himself for the future. Do you think uh, the aspirations in terms of this bill is such? Well, I, I don't know. All I know is that if we could have gone after the 6.4 billion from Express Pearl, you know, many people don't have to pay taxes. First quarter taxes, all that was gained was just 300 billion Sri Lankan rupees. <coughs> if the 6.4 billion, none of us had to be taxed. US dollars. <laughs> yes. And how come there is not a single discussion on that? Who has done it? Where it has happened? I mean, you have people who come to cabinet, uh, into parliament and say this is the account that somebody has paid which nobody has found that account and no no, no action taken. <laughs> uh, actually, Rohanta, we've been trying to fit the Express Pearl issue into the Face the Nation schedule, but all this uh, rubbishy uh, <laughs> drafts that keep coming up. They've been and, displacing it. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so you can just imagine, Niresh, can you see? See, y you need direction right now to put all the best brains behind where you can get the best return. That's how we run business now. No, absolutely. So, absolutely. so I mean, Express Pearl, you know, this fertilizer issue, not yet resolved, no? I mean, tea industry has crashed, 52 million kilograms of tea has declined. Uh, all the crops, rubber, cinnamon, everything has dropped by 40%. Even now, we are not correcting it, no? Even as we speak today, you can talk to the farmers and ask, what is the fertilizer that has come? You know, when I told my dad, damn, he's a TV, just a tea planter. When I said, he said, Ronta, why don't you talk about the tea industry? You know, 40% decline, 52 million kilograms of tea again lost. You know, and no discussion how to revive. And, no, and even now it's not being revived. Issue, which is <laughs> and we are talking about... <laughs> the instability of, of the exchange rate. Um, it's just crazy. You and we are talking about this bill, which has not been drafted properly. And a, a member of this panel says he has a better bill. What is the status of a country? No, it's not sort of, I'm, I'm not saying it's mine, my personal thing. It's yeah. something that the Ministry Commission, it's in the Ministry's official record. Which is a better version. <coughs> but but now, now we, we spoke of authoritarianism and also the best brains. And it is authoritarianism which brought us to this bankruptcy uh, situation in the first place, where the fertilizer issue and many other issues uh, one-sided decisions which a lot of people warned about and authoritarianism didn't listen we ended up where we are now so we do need the best brains moving forward and but Niresh, that is not what that's not authoritarianism and Niresh, my argument is that we are now going and talking to the nations of the world about debt restructuring you thought they are going to accept this kind of document and this way of running 
an organization or a country. Where, where, what is the future you give a youngster? No, but, 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 but Bhavani, they have wrapped up uh, uh, anti-terrorism <laughs> uh, way beforehand. No, they, they knew the repercussions would be bad. As a result of that, the situation changed. Don't yeah, you but you know, something Niresh just said, you know, we should be having conversations about key issues. Mm. We should be having conversations about what happened, what led to the economic crisis, what's happened to accountability on those mm. fronts. But the last few months, at least this year, we've been extremely kept busy by certain drafts that keep churning out from the government side. Now, it just begs the question, why are these things coming out at particular time periods? That so seems that to be we, like a strategy as it, well. It, it seems so. I mean, I'm <coughs> saying it seems so. But see, for a couple of months, we were very busy trying to understand, tackle, challenge the anti-terror law, the, the proposed bill. Now <laughs> we are debating yeah, this. this. Yeah. Then the question is what, and then of course on the side, but very important, are the particular risks that happen. Uh, the government at one point says they're not going to use the PTA, but then some people are arrested under the PTA. You know, it's it, at one level you're thinking, who is calling the shots? Are they not talking to each other? Um, there doesn't seem to be a communication even within the government. <coughs> But really distracts from the, the topic at hand. Even today, now we're talking about right to truth. When we talk about right to truth, you know, we, when so many people last year came to the streets demanding for a system change, demanding for a change in governance, demanding for political accountability, we can't de keep demanding for those because we are now fighting these. It's like we are firefighting. Yeah. We are firefighting, and so <clears throat> then the whole question about the whole issue of fertilizer, the whole pearl, express pearl, all of these things, where there is some, if really we have time to go into it, there are fundamental questions on those that can benefit the people. So. Instead, these insidious tactics are being used that have such consequences that we are then trying to kind of push back on this. Yeah? Th this seems to be a nearest, like a strategy, you know, like a long-term strategy to be in power, <laughs> to make sure that, you know, um, the media is kept out of the real, situ the real issues and then trying to uh, suppress them on the other side, you know. Plus, it, without having elections. Without having elections, it, it seems like a major plan, isn't definitely, it, uh, Manjula? Definitely, definitely. That's that's why I mentioned earlier. Actually, that is that is the, that is the basic plan. This probably will not even come into play. Yeah. This might be even uh, thrown out of the window. Timing game might until just having. We hope. Keep us busy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when they try to do something else. Yeah. It's not just the media, no. I mean, it's about. If you remember uh, the anti-terror, there was one clause we discussed at, in this show about the prescription. Mm. That prescription could apply to any organization. Mm. Now, who would have issued prescription orders? The president. On what grounds? Reasonable grounds. Mm. So, you know, one individual, I'm not saying just this president, mm. one individual had such broad power and they didn't go through any process other than possibly him or her saying, I don't like this institution, I'm going to prescribe it for one year. <coughs> so what we are seeing now is something equally problematic that there is a, it's an executive overreach in different ways. And what's the check? What's the due process? Where do people go to in terms of fighting this back? So it's not <coughs> just media institution. This we are talking about media, but there is this a tactic, and not just this government. Successive governments that have used to shut down dissent and having a different opinion. <coughs> now people get activated when they think it's going to come and affect them, but and they forget the larger consequences of all these things. Because as Rohan also said, where is then the public confidence? Who is going to engage with a country, with a government that is so hell-bent on repression at different levels? And then the narrative that is created is 
it's a it, he or she is a terrorist, is a fascist, is trying to destabilize. So a, a bill like this could really, it's entrenching those practices we've seen since last year as well. Those who dare to critique, challenge, to get to the streets are the troublemakers, are the traitors, are the terrorists. And those labeling will carry through because there's various tools being used to go after them. Mm. And this is just one tool in that playbook. I think that we need to understand. Shamir, yeah. my humble recommendation to a media institution as powerful as you guys is pick up the issues of the country, discuss the issues of the country. And when there are these kinds of documents that come with, we know it's a deflection strategy, don't bring it to the media. Now, I would have loved to have discussed about SME <laughs> strategy today. No, I was, I mean, look so at it, Shamir. Shamir, yeah. Shamir, just look, no, Shamir, just look at to, no, the thing is, the thing is, Rohan, the, yeah. we, we would love to do that, but if we don't, I'll tell you a classic example, like the anti-terrorism bill. Yeah. We voiced no over and over again opposition. Yeah. If not, this bill would have gone through. It yeah. was almost in the order paper as well. They yeah. scheduled it for yeah. the 25th of April. And because of the media um, uh, yeah, opposition, others also, yeah. others also yeah. the media and civic Don't take all the, I mean, you <laughs> guys don't want all the blame, yeah. don't take all, yeah. the, all the credit. Yeah. No, no, so no, I mean, no. That, that, effort, uh, <coughs> that effort actually, that has been uh, success. Yeah. That, Something that, because we also as an organization got an appointment with the minister to uh, talk on anti-terrorist bill tomorrow. That means actually they are gradually, I mean, at least they are trying to listen others. Mm. That is the effort you all taken uh, because of? Yeah. So uh, uh, on the anti-terrorism bill, we spent four consecutive weeks of this show okay. on that. When and we, we were well. trying to get away from it, mm. Rohanta, we were, we were trying to get away, but every week when we have a list of uh, uh, topics and when we looked at it, this was the main one over and over again. Uh, we had the Minister of Justice uh, one time on that and at that point, the Express Pearl issue had also come up. So we badly wanted to ask him about that as well, but we just couldn't on, on one so I, I think, so I, I think, Rant, on that, I, I think it's so critical for media entities to highlight issues, and not just these kind of laws, but highlight a broad range of issues. The problem is that we're so busy fighting the more immediate that yeah. we don't, uh, we are also stretched thin. But I guess one thing maybe to learn from even just the last couple of months is that this is going to keep coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Closer to election, there'll be more and more things coming up. And, and I think with, if anything we can learn from 2019 is pre-election, just think of what happened that led to this mindset that people said national security is the most important. That trend is starting to happen. Be it laws, be it arrest, that's happening. <coughs> Who's the correct citizen? Who is following the law as opposed to those who are questioning, critiquing? That narrative is starting to take shape. And the question I think some of us have been putting out is, who is also behind shaping those narratives and debates? Mm. And that's why we come back to regulation. Responsibility is so critical but how it's done is also so important. If I make one point, Shamir, yeah, yeah. is I would love to discuss SME. You know, 73% of Sri Lanka's economy is SMEs. 83% of the exporters are SMEs. SMEs are wiped out no, in the no, country. No, no. It's, it's important. It's important to talk <laughs> oh, about it's, that. It's, it's, it's important yes, to talk yesterday, about it. Yes, yeah, 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 Niresh, yesterday, Niresh, yesterday, yesterday I was yeah. talking to the chairman of a SME authority and she's saying, that the utility cost has increased by 300 percent. The interest have increased by again 300 percent. So sh yesterday, to pay the last month's salary bill, they had to take a loan. So, and she said she's kind of a, quite a large institution which can take that pressure. Well, I have a question on that. Now, mm -hmm. now we say this SME sector uh, is not happy with how, how they are being taxed or the utilities or whatever it is. Tell me one authority who has raised this concern, having a press conference, uh, talking about these problems and telling, uh, telling the government that this is not right, uh, this should be looked at. Which, which authority is saying this? I Google, I Google this. None. Shamir, I Google as soon as I heard this discussion yesterday, I Googled. 
She has been doing this for the whole of last three months. In the media? In the media. Mm. And she's very vocal, very upbeat. And, and then only it just struck me, you know, you know, if you look at the tourism industry, SME industry, uh, if you take New Area uh, uh, district, almost two to three hundred small timers are wiped out. Mm. Wiped out and it struck me, guys, we, we don't fall into that category. So it's a forgotten, and they are not the people who are in the, all the papers. They don't have the muscle to go to the media. You see, they, they do this pocket media. That is why it's stuff. important for the chamber to raise these issues because the chamber has a better strength, better muscle. That to would be the discussion the then. You know. Definitely. Yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. No, no, no. But at, 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 at the same time, yeah. Rohanta, if this were to pass, pass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you would not be able to say anything about SMEs. Uh, because if you are closed down. Yeah, we, would be, uh, well, we would be closed down <laughs> because we are discussing yeah. SMEs. Niraj, we will continue to say. Yeah. <laughs> if, if the government thinks that yeah. uh, this is affecting the national economy, Mm. Um, that's it. <laughs> they might lock they up might Rohan. Lock up, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about locking up Rohan. They might take a license, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Niresh. Anyway, I want to close today's discussion, but I want to ask all four of you, with regard to the way forward, what must we do as a nation? What should be our priorities right now? So let's start off with uh, Manjula. Yeah, the first of all, actually, what, uh, what uh, Dr. Rohanta said, actually, that the talking on SMEs, actually, that we need to, we need to concern on freedom of thoughts first. After that, uh, we can talk uh, anything, any topics. The way forward, regarding that, uh, what I mentioned <coughs> earlier, that uh, at least that uh, Justice Minister is uh, trying to listen to others, giving some meetings for organization and civil society activists and uh, some institutions that mean uh, it is a it is a result of that taken by uh, many individuals and media institutions and uh, 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 civil leaders then the regarding the process actually one thing they can do is actually that uh, open a window to discuss among citizens then uh, what uh, professor correctly mentioned actually at least we can we can identify this as a white paper if so, they can come up with the framework. Then uh, we will be able to provide uh, more and more information as well as other ideas. Then only actually they can uh, draft a law. That, that should be the way. But we can't see uh, that uh, such, a, such, a, such a process to be uh, followed by the government at the moment. Uh, that is, it is taking a revenge like that actually when uh, <laughs> having uh, seen this document that you the word using at, at and, and and also the wording then the way forward actually that the my 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 take is that actually they should be given more chances to citizens to obtain their ideas thank you very much uh, manjula gajanaka executive director of the institute for democratic reforms and electoral studies ronda uh, samir i would i mean we always look at sri lanka and we say sri lanka is bankrupt but there are another 72 countries which are just like us, which a lot of people don't know, right? So that's what World Bank says. So I, I, I would just ask, who are these countries? How come they are rebuilding themselves? Take the best practices and, and, and put it on the table. I mean, I would say that's what is required rather than, we know that this homegrown model has not worked. You know, why are we again going back to the homegrown model? We know it has not worked. You know, and I don't understand why we keep, you know, you know, going back to this homegrown. It from this discussion, I'm not an expert, but when I listen to the experts, it looks like this is another homegrown model that has been brought. Why is it that we're going on this homegrown model when there are expected best practices in the world? Why are we not taking it on the table? And I'm just confused. How come we are such an intelligent nation, top ten scientists of the world? Every day you have a conference. Every week you have a top conference stage in Sri Lanka, in all the hotels. I have never seen such intellectual capital in any of the other countries that I work in, Maldives or in Pakistan. Never. But we have all these conferences, so much of intellectual discourse. Why is it not been turned to practice? There's something wrong, no? <laughs> what is wrong, Ron? The system is not absorbing the best talent, I suppose which is another classic example like this. So outside the system, it's been discussed and, you know, again we go back. Rather now you were also part of the previous government heading a state institution. 
even you were thrown out, no, Rohan? So, uh, if you don't agree to corruption, you know, you're thrown out. We are very, I'm proud of it right now. Maybe at that time, you know, you sometimes ask yourself, you know, should you play the game? But then, yet, I mean, we're from multinational companies, Shamir. So, you know, for us, corruption is not a choice. So we say no. But today, when we go back, we are so happy that we said no. <laughs> you know? Ron, you said there are seven or two other countries in the world like Sri Lanka, but I don't think the situation that we saw, you know, how, how things panned out after 2019 elections is something that any 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 of us envisaged. Don't you, don't you agree with that? Well, it happened in Pakistan, uh, Shamir. It's a repeat. It is happening right now in yeah, Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, these are case studies of the world. You know, history repeats itself. And you, you, we would never have thought a Sri Lankan is going to revolt. Never. I mean, we see this over time. But then history repeated itself. And you would, sometimes you can't believe because we are in consumer marketing. We know how consumers will react if you don't put a proper product. But sometimes we never think that a housewife of Sri Lanka will ever be like a housewife of India. So outwardly driven, go to the streets and shout saying, I but don't like it, your product. Is, isn't that the system change that the people wanted? And do you think that system change is now being seen at grassroots or even in the country? I mean, this document, which I had no knowledge of when I studied for the last two days to come here, does it reflect system change somewhere? When a, a team member says, uh, one acceptor is in the ministry also. What is the system change to me? <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rohan Tatskora, <laughs> the former chairman, EDB and Tourism. Attorney at Law, Bhavani Fonseca. Uh, so, Shamir, I, I, when I get a call to join a program yeah. like yours, it raises questions because it's becoming quite regular to talk about a problematic law practice and it speaks to the the governance and democracy in this country that every couple of weeks we have to raise concerns about something deeply problematic and goes to the heart of people's rights and democracy in this country from the anti-terror to the rehabilitation to now a broadcasting these i would say are just examples of how much more we need to do to ensure that we actually protect what we have and what we call as democracy. Now 75 years after independence, there are so many things I think we just have to keep improving on. The lawmaking process is one of it, that a few elites or few key people decide what form and shape very important pieces of law is going to shape this country and citizens are kept out of that. Last year citizens came out to the streets in numbers, quite a remarkable sight, calling for change. That change I would say very clearly hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. But when we see that with all these things that keep getting thrown our way, that the government has to actually pause and rethink and then call for consultations. However problematic their process, something is working. That we are having some kind of impact. So that's important. So with this issue, what I'll say is that there's some positive things that we can learn from as citizens in terms of activism, in terms of critique, in terms of challenge. And one of the things we need to keep remembering is that the government is there, it's there to kind of, it, it, it's holding things in trust for the people. If they're not doing their job, it's our right to keep challenging and critiquing. And what the Supreme Court has very clearly said is never let the government assume it has the guardianship to control what is in our mind, in our thoughts, in our expression. So these kind of pieces of law is going to keep us very busy for the foreseeable future. I'm, I, I suspect after this there'll be another one and another one and we'll be talking about that. What I think we need to do now is while we challenge, keep pushing back, is also take on the other more important issues as well. 
And I think for all of us, while we firefight, it's to have the broader conversation. Mm. What does this country mean to us going to the future? Where are the youth? Many are leaving the country. How do you ensure that they have confidence to come back? How do we get the investors to come back? But also ensure this country is a place where we all can live in as citizens and in dignity. And this is something, another determination very recently, a Supreme Court determination spoke about dignity of the citizen. That I think we have lost because we're firefighting, we're pointing fingers, we're saying what is not done. So I think we need to take a step back and realize this is going to keep coming back to us, keeping us busy. But we need to also step above all of it to ensure that we demand for a better mm. governance model. So, uh, yes. I mean, I yeah. think uh, going from that, yeah. um, we need to have two episodes of Face the Nation each week. Uh, <laughs> one to deal with the real issues, uh, such as the SMBs and so on, and one for these piddly people. Basically, you're going to keep us very busy. Yeah. <coughs> That's right what you're saying. <laughs> right. Uh, last but not at all the least, um, Professor Rohan Samajeva, Chairperson of Learn Asia. For a long time, I think I've been, I've been involved in uh, preparing laws uh, so I sort of know how the mechanics of it work, which is you draft a concept note, you draft uh, it in sort of technical terms, then you send it to the cabinet and then it goes to legal draftsman and so on. I know that process. Uh, and I've also been involved in implementing laws. So I can remember I was looking at the telecommunications law and I was going through the sections and I said, has this been used, has this been used? It was about seven, eight years. And it was like there was a law that had public hearing provisions, public notice procedure. Nothing had been used. So I said, hey, okay, let's, flex, let's work our muscles. Let's have a public hearing. Let's have public no notice proceeding. Let's actually implement this thing. So uh, with that experience, I have been quite uh, disturbed by the fact that when we have technical legislation that has very broad implications, we don't ha consult enough. So when I was doing it, I would prepare this sort of concept note and we would have a, I would put, I didn't have the money or the time to make the translations and so on. We would put a newspaper notice saying this could be downloaded from such and such site. And here is the place where you can come and have a discussion with the consultants and the people who are managing the consultants. Even with trade uh, agreements that I was involved in, I went to the professional associations and I had consultations. So I believe, I don't do consultations for sort of altruistic purposes. I think you do consultations because you learn yeah. and you can make your document better, yeah. right? So I think that whole uh, white paper model that we lost in the 1980s uh, and the idea of proper interministerial coordination, we have actually things being smuggled through uh, cabinet without the relevant ministries being informed and their comments being, obs being obtained. It's only the finance ministry that is never ignored, but other people tend to be ignored sometimes. So I think we need to get that system back, right? So that's very important, get that system back and in addition, let's have consultations. So we have sort of odd mechanisms, like we did not a white paper, but what we did with the data protection uh, legislation in 2019 and then we have the sort of the situation with the anti-terrorism law I I've been having too many mini meetings with the Minister of Justice because I went and negotiated section by section uh, the 20th 21st Amendment right uh, we took a large number of people with us to talk about the anti-terrorism law and we were instrumental in getting it postponed uh, you know, it's like the elephant, right? You guys think you poked it in this side. We were poking it from another side and the elephant moved. So we don't know who, what caused it to move, but all these people contributed. So I think we need to tell the government, particularly with these kinds of laws, you know, let's do it broadly. And I think it's a good sign that uh, anti-terrorism was pulled back. Uh, and then uh, uh, corruption, same. 
we had a lot of consultations and I would say for people who are looking for system change for a long time we have understood that the existing Siabok law was ineffective and there were people who were working there people like Sarat Jayamana who actually came up with language I was also involved when I was in government trying to contribute to the asset uh, declaration component and so on so those things I'm happy to see them I don't think anything is perfect laws are not perfect but I think it's a, it's a major move forward to get that law instead of the rubbishy piece of legislation that we now have right so I think we should see appreciate the good parts as well so that's in my view if you're looking for system change which involves anti-corruption I think it's a very important thing that we've got that thing done uh, it has gone through some form of consultation the Supreme Court has spoken some amendments will be made and it'll it'll come uh, if you have a different perception of system change I think there are more laws that will have to come in the next few months there is no uh, no alternative but for more laws to come because quite a lot of our laws uh, are bad uh, and I think whatever said and done I mean I disagree with uh, this particular legislation but on the other hand the agricultural scientists who wanted a simple meeting with the president to present the views on the oil palm ban were not given a meeting they were completely blocked out saying this we have done we are not willing to discuss there's no point in talking about it right and here people like us we were trying to tell the government this is not how this matter should be dealt with so compared to 2021 I see a lot of positives in 2023 right I don't see some kind of vast conspiracy I see maybe ineptitude incompetence uh, and various other factors uh, but I, I see I, I see a, a different attitude and I'm, I appreciate that even though it has ruined my life uh, because you know I mean I keep studying these damn things and writing and so on and so forth which is uh, not something I appreciate and again I mean there are things like in your case you know the Parata execution the chapter 11 uh, bankruptcy provisions we tried to put this on the agenda I've been I've organized uh, well we organized 132 webinars with key players and at least half of them I must have personally organized and you know these were things that we brought up what are the things that we need for the uh, SME sector but we couldn't we can't get those particular ministers to act this guy the <laughs> Minister of Justice is acting on whatever he's given and it's he's turning them out in some cases he has got documents he can work with in this case I think he's trying to develop something de novo which is <laughs> unfortunate thank you very much Professor Rohan <laughs> Samajiv a very quick question for you don't you think incompetence is more dangerous than conspiracy uh, I, I, I actually never talk about conspiracy <laughs> I'm not a conspiracy theorist I don't know conspiracies I don't ascribe motives it's something I learned I never do so I you know I, I just say you know when you see a document which doesn't have definitions but then you know I, I would tell you this is not limited to this do you know that our legal draftsman department came up with a constitutional amend, amendment where the membership of a commission was three and the quorum was three that's our legal draftsman's department <coughs> membership is three quorum is three and generally all people you know how occupy it, those positions you know now how, uh, why, can you explain that to me is that uh, is that nothing but incompetence you, you know how i define it uh, professor sri lanka <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much professor rohan samaji a chairperson of learn asia attorney at law bhavani fonseca <coughs> senior researcher center for policy alternatives dr rohan tatukora a former chairman edb and tourism manjula gajanayaka executive director institute for democratic reforms and electoral studies thank you very much <laughs> niresh for joining us this evening uh, on Face the Nation, I leave you tonight to be the court as I always do. Bad laws are the worst sort of tyranny. Take care and good night.